Hello, everybody, and welcome to our uh, webinar uh, entitled Tactics of Defense of False Advertising Claims. I'm Roger Kalizi. I'm a partner at Venable and chair of the Advertising Litigation Group. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us on our webinar, Tactics of Defense of False Advertising Claims. I'm Roger Kalizi, a partner with Venable and chair of the Advertising Litigation Group. And uh, my name is William Lawrence. I am an associate here at Venable, and I am a member of the Advertising Group and the Intellectual Property Litigation Group. All right, so I want to set the stage before we start. And uh, this is uh, something I learned uh, very early in my career. And uh, I think it's just uh, so true in dealing with, with clients and companies. So uh, first, you know, claims of false advertising, of course, must be taken uh, very seriously. And uh, so uh, successful legal action against the company from emergency litigation, like a temporary restraining order, or preliminary injunction uh, can be devastating to a company. It could result in lost market share, uh, having a recall of products, uh, and because packaging can contains false claims, uh, which is very expensive and very complicated. You lose shelf space from in big box and other retailers. There could be high dollar damages at the end of the case, and certainly a loss of reputation. <clears throat> and of course, uh, you all know, uh, if you're in-house and uh, if you're uh, with companies that um, it's very difficult to get that shelf space back if you have to take your products off of it. It won't remain empty while your products are gone until you can replace it with something else. You're gonna put your competitor right in that spot. So <clears throat> when I, you first think about false advertising claims and where there are disputes between uh, competitors, uh, you think, all right, or, or even, even with regulators, you think, are these, claims of false advertising, are they legal problems and legal issues, or are they business problems and business issues? I can tell you that every CEO of every company looks at these as business problems. And that, that, that mindset is very important as you work to help resolve those claims of false advertising, uh, both in the preparation of it and in uh, defending them. And so what you have to do immediately is to figure out, all right, uh, we have these claims, how are we gonna to respond to them? And do you have a solution? Where does the company need to go? What does the company need to do? What are the circumstances that, that point to a particular solution? And you have to uh, communicate with everybody at the company to make sure you're heading for the right solution. And you must have a strategy to get there. If you're just litigating for the sake of litigating and going through the steps of litigation, it's not gonna, it's not gonna really provide the result uh, that, that may be what the company wants. Sometimes the litigation is what the company needs and wants. Sometimes it's not having litigation and stopping it as soon as possible. Might be a, a deal in the works or something like that. So you need to find out what the end game is. And when you think about these ad false advertising claims, as business problems and not legal problems. Your, your job, of course, is to <clears throat> solve the legal, solve the business problem by solving, using legal uh, things that are available to us to solve that business problem. And when you look at it like that, uh, I think everybody, the client is certainly happier and everybody's on board and, and following the strategy to get the solution that, that you, of course, will all know is, is where you want to end up. So with that stage set and with that context, we want to talk a little bit about a few things today. Uh, first, we want to give you a little bit of the lay of the land of who the players are. How do these disputes come in? Who do you have to worry about? Who's going to be the person initiating these disputes? It may be a competitor. It may be a regulator. It may be a self-regulatory entity. There are a number of people and a number of ways 
uh, for these disputes to begin. And we want to give you kind of an idea of what you can expect for the initiation of any sort of false advertising dispute. Next, we want to talk about what we think of is the first step. And the first step really is prevention. And prevention comes from preparation and substantiation. Preparation in terms of having your advertising review, thinking very critically about what sort of claims you're making, and substantiation, once you identify those claims, making sure you can back them up and being prepared to back them up if you ever have an issue. Then next, we wanna talk about a very, very common way that you are signaled that there may be an issue with your advertising and that a dispute may be coming, and that's the cease and desist letter. This is a letter that you'll get from your competitors, uh, in-house counsel, or maybe outside counsel. And what do you do when you get that letter? Um, one of our favorite tax tactics is to make it a double-edged sword in terms of really looking closely at your competitor's advertising to see is their house clean? What can we say against them? What potential counterclaims do we have? And really finding leverage in these situations where someone is accusing you of violation of advertising law. Then next, we're going to talk about the regulatory investigation. Uh, this is probably one of the most daunting ways that you can find out that there may be a advertising dispute coming. You get a letter from the FTC or from an attorney general, pretty much potentially accusing you of violating the law. Uh, it's a scary prospect for many companies. Um, there's a lot of downside risk when you get a letter from the government. But we want to talk a little bit about how to approach that as well. And then next uh, is the competitor lawsuit. This is when one of your competitors decides cease and desist wasn't enough. You didn't comply. You didn't do what they wanted you to do. So they're going to sue you. You know, what do you do? How do you find a way to properly leverage the tactics that we're going to talk about today to find a way, hopefully, to resolution or find a way to do your best to defend against those sorts of claims? And finally, and probably most importantly, the resolution and creative solutions. As Roger alluded to, this is a business problem. You are in the business of serving your customers and providing products. You are not in the business of litigating. So every time a litigation starts, you should be looking at the end. And the best way to usually find an end is to be a creative. It's not all about dollars and cents all the time. There are a lot of different business avenues and ways to find solutions to potential advertising disputes that uh, it's important to think about uh, to hopefully get you more quickly back to what you do best and that's serving your customers. All right, so the players of course then are uh, number one uh, and from a government standpoint, federal government is the Federal Trade Commission and uh, they're authorized to take action against misleading, deceptive, false advertising. And they use everything as, as we'll talk about in a little bit civil investigative demands, cease and desist orders, injunctive relief, civil penalties where available. Uh, you have attorneys general of the various states. Uh, there are many, most states uh, have uh, what are sometimes referred as mini FTC Act or Deceptive and Unfair Trade Practices Act, um, and which under various state statutes make adver false advertising illegal uh, under state law and attorneys general are authorized to enforce those statutes. And sometimes uh, individuals and competitors can, can bring actions as well. Uh, for example, uh, plaintiff's attorney who bring class action, advertising class actions, for example. Um, you also have competitors who can, who can sue under uh, the uh, Deceptive Unfair Trade Practices Acts of states. But typically a competitor uh, will sue under the Lanham Act, uh, which uh, basically prohibits false advertising as well. Uh, there are different burdens of proof for each of these uh, uh, ways that um, uh, uh, advertisers come to or have to defend the Federal Trade Commission or Attorney General, or even at the NAD, which is Alternative Dispute Resolution uh, and the Better Business Bureau has been uh, utilizing and making available the National Advertising Division, uh, which uh, allows competitors to bring uh, suits over uh, advertising. <clears throat> and uh, many, many uh, big companies and small companies as well use the NAD because it's an inexpensive way uh, to get relief. It doesn't cost a lot of money compared to litigation. And it doesn't, um, <clears throat> of course, there are no damages. 
and it's a, a forum that allows you to resolve uh, issues of false or deceptive advertising and level the playing field without uh, spending a lot of money if there's not another way to get there. So as Roger alluded to, the FTC biggest tool in their toolbox is Section 5 of the FTC Act. And generally it's prohibiting unfair methods of competition in or affecting commerce and unfair or deceptive acts or practices in or affecting commerce are declared unlawful. So we're not gonna talk a whole, whole lot about the law and the ins and outs of that, but we're trying to give you an idea of where these sorts of disputes are coming from, uh, what laws they're gonna come under and how they get started. Towards that end, we're going to start with the FTC and the civil investigative demand. This is probably one of the most daunting starts to a false advertising dispute that's out there. You might get a letter from the FTC, which is simply going to be essentially going to be a request for information, a request for information related to any potential violations of the laws that the FTC suspects you might be guilty of. And a CID is going to be potentially pretty comprehensive. They can ask for all types of information. They can ask for documents, of course. They can ask for testimony of yourself or your employees. Uh, they can ask you questions, which they'll call interrogatories, which you're going to have to give a comprehensive answer to and potentially support with documents and that sort of thing. So it ends up being a pretty intensive process in terms of receiving a CID and figuring out what to do about it. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about the steps you're gonna take and you know where you wanna go if you receive sort of one of these demands. The other way, and maybe in conjunction with a CID, uh, that the FTC can potentially begin a false advertising dispute with you or your company is an enforcement action. Um, we're not going to get too detailed. We can provide more information. We can provide these slides at the end, but we just want to give you an idea of the sort of several different procedures that the FTC may use in order to bring an enforcement action. The first is administrative adjudications. Uh, second, direct litigation. Uh, for rule violations, um, they can refer their case to the Department of Justice and have them prosecute you for any potential violations. Uh, they have penalty offense authority where they can actually seek monetary damages and they have preliminary and pre permanent injunction avenues where they can try to enjoin any activity that they believe violates the law. And then similar to the FTC, but more so on a state level is the Attorney General. Now, the Attorney General, they're empowered to investigate uh, unfair and deceptive or abusive practices of the law, uh, often under what we call UDAP laws, Unfair and Deceptive Practices Act. These are the many FTC acts that Roger was talking about a little bit earlier. And they're pretty broad. They usually broadly prohibit deceptive or unconscionable acts against consumers. Uh, one of the very common ones that Roger and I see a lot and that often are, is implicated is the Florida Deceptive and Unfair Trade Practices Act, um, and it broadly declares that unfair methods of competition, unconscionable acts or practices, and unfair or deceptive acts or practices in the conduct of any trade or com commerce are unlawful. So once again, much like the FTC, these actions can begin with a request for information concerning the suspected violations, and those are usually called civil subpoenas as opposed to civil investigative demands. All right, and, and uh, under uh, the Florida Deceptive and Unfair Trade Practices Act, there is a attorney's fee provision, and it, it typically goes to uh, the person who wins that that action. So if you're bringing a claim under the uh, under FDUPTA against a competitor, make sure you feel like you can win that claim. Otherwise, you may be paying all the lawyers in the case. And uh, actually, the reverse is true. Uh, when you have to sue somebody for false claims uh, on, and you use a state law uh, uh, and you're doing it in Florida and you use FDUPTA, and there's some other statutes across the country that have a uh, attorney's fee provision. It's an, it's an additional piece of leverage that uh, should make uh, the competitor look very closely about where their claims are. So uh, get going quickly to uh, competitor actions uh, under the Lanham Act is typically where you would see them. Uh, and it's uh, we leave these uh, statutes here for you 
in our in our slide deck just so you have them if you want to look at them more closely i don't need to read them to you but um uh, as if you if you think about a 43a claim it's uh, false or misleading statements and that could be about your product or about the competitor's own product right there has to be some deception or at least a tendency to deceive uh it's likely to influence purchasing decisions uh, there's interstate commerce requirement that the goods travel in interstate commerce and a likelihood of injury, even though you don't have to prove actual injury. And unlike the, uh, the FTC and the uh, states, uh, the, and, and even at the uh, NAD, the burden is on the advertiser in those, in those forum to uh, prove that the advertising is truthful. Under the Lanham Act, the burden is on the plaintiff to prove that the defendant's advertising is false. And that's a, a big difference and, and one of the things you consider when choosing uh, what form you're gonna, you, you might bring a, bring a case. Um, so one other thing I wanna say about the Lanham Act, and that is that you don't have to be a competitor uh, to sue under the Lanham Act. And that's that decision, I think it's almost 10 years ago, uh, Lexmark says that you don't have to be a competitor Editor, but you have to have uh, some interest and you fall within a zone of interest protected by the law. In this case, you know, under 43A, uh, it would be, you might be a supplier, you might be a collateral business that's affected by a defendant's uh, activity who's not a competitor, but you're in that area and you have to show proximate cause uh, of, of injury uh, for violation of the statute there. Uh, and then finally, uh, I mentioned the NAD earlier. Uh, this is a, uh, a great place uh, to bring a claim if you, uh, and, and as we get to some cease and desist letters aspect of this presentation, um, oftentimes you find that uh, if you can't work it out with your competitor through a cease and desist letter, uh, you may want to bring a claim at the NAD. Uh, the NAD has uh, a lot of different methods and, and ways that you can bring a claim. Sometimes it can be expedited. Other times it has to be a fuller claim. But the, the reality, and at the end of the day, it's a less expensive way to uh, level the playing field so that you uh, it can, can compete fairly with your competitors in the space. And the reason that a lot of big companies and smaller companies use the NAD is because it's quick, it's less expensive than litigation, and uh, and you can work it out. And if you can't work it out quickly, and now the NAD has, uh, I guess it's been a little while since they've started this, allows you to, to resolve a matter between competitors uh, without going through the whole NAD process and having a decision. Those decisions, by the way, are uh, published as press releases. And if uh, the uh, advertiser doesn't follow, for example, if they're required to remove the claims, then it will get referred to the FTC for investigation. And that oftentimes is enough of, a, of an incentive to have the advertising removed without having to take any more action. So uh, in a sense, it's a way to uh, get some, in, some injunctive relief uh, without uh, spending a lot of money seeking a TRO or preliminary injunction. So with that, lay of the land kind of out of the way, you kind of know where these disputes may come from, um, how they kind of operate and how they begin. And it's a lot, it come, come from a lot of places, a lot of different avenues, a lot of different procedures, but the good news is there is a one solution that can help you avoid a lot of these disputes. And this is what we like to call the first step and it's preparation and substantiation. Um, first, it's always important to try to engage competent advertising counsel often and early to review your advertising. This is part of preparation. Make sure that you have someone either inside your organization or outside your organization begin to look through all of your advertising and start to identify the, the claims that you're making. It's important because all advertising must be truthful and not misleading or puffery, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And the claims if necessary, must be substantiated. So whenever you're looking at your advertising and you're trying to interpret claims, you're always gonna do it from the reasonable consumer looking at the advertisement as a whole, not particular pieces, 
not just what you expressly say, but also the overall message that the advertisement actually conveys. And it doesn't have to be words. It can be graphics. It can be pictures. It can be the way you use the brand names of yourself or your competitors. It can be the logos that you use. And this all goes to the net impression of your ad. What is your advertisement, whether it be in print or media, what is it really saying to the consumer? What, what message is a reasonable person going to take away concerning what your product actually does or what your service can actually provide? And in terms of evaluating that standard, you're never going to assume that consumers have any sort of particular expert or niche knowledge, but you're also not going to assume that you're going to take away unreasonable expectations from the ad. It's going to be what a normal person is going to look at your ad and the message they're going to walk away from is how you want to generally look at these claims. So what types of claims are we talking about? Well, claims can come in many different shapes and sizes. Um, first, it's critical to determine you know, what sort of claims are actually in the ad. You know, first, they're express claims. They're claims that you put right out there. My product does X, Y, and Z for you. My product can clean 70% better than you know, Y product. Now, these are claims that you're going to put right up front that you're going to directly make to the consumer, promises that you're going to make to them concerning what your services can do. But then there are also implied claims. You know, implied claim can be something where you have a demonstration of your product cleaning a surface and the other product cleaning a surface and somehow the other product that's not your product, the surface, surface looks much dirtier than the surface that your product cleans. You didn't directly say that your product was better or that your product can clean better, but you certainly implied it and a reasonable consumer who's going to be watching it is it going to take away the message that your product is better. So the types of claims can include a different variations of expressing and implied claims as well. So you have performance claims. I mean, this is probably most common in things like cars or motorcycles, you know, zero to 60 seconds, zero to 60 in 0.25 seconds. Then you have uh, superiority claims. Coke is better than Pe Pepsi. Windex is better than XYZ window cleaner, whatever it may be. It's usually comparing your brand to another brand to say that your brand is better, which is a pretty common way of advertising. Uh, then you have the establishment claims, um, claims that say something to the effect of studies show three out of five dentists prepare, uh, prefer X toothpaste versus y, y toothpaste. And there are different ways that you actually have to substantiate those claims. Um, and then there are up to claims. We know this best from internet promises that often are not true where it says you'll get up to speeds of X, Y, and Z to try to entice you to buy one internet over the other. Those claims also have to be substantiated in particular ways. And then there are product attribute claims. These, these claims are very popular now, especially in sort of the natural food or the organic industry, where it's 100% organic, organic or 100% free range or completely natural. Um, or a very common one is, of course, made in the USA. These sort of product attribute claims are the sorts of things that are gonna give consumers a beneficial outlook on your product versus another, another product but they also have to be substantiated. And that's really the key defense to all of these potential claims, expressed or implied or any of the variations. Okay, so uh, substantiation, have it in the bag. And speaking of having it in the bag, uh, the uh, CLE code for this presentation is false 2022. That's false 2022. And we'll let you know again at the end about that, uh, that uh, code. All right, so as uh, William said, the best defense is to be prepared for claims of false uh, advertising against you. And uh, the best way to have uh, defense of that is through substantiation. I've broken this down into two buckets, uh, one being scientific substantiation and the other using uh, consumer perception substantiation, using consumer perception studies or surveys as they're called sometimes. So with the types of claims that you might use for uh, uh, science, scientific substantiation for are express claims like the, um, uh, where you say there's a particular attribute about your product that they can do X, Y, or Z. So having uh, substantiation to do that claim. 
uh, necessary implication claims. These are claims where there's only one takeaway, where you show uh, using William's example, uh, a product cleaning um, and uh, showing it better than the other. The Im implication is that there are tests there that prove that. The only takeaway is one product cleans better than the other. Uh, there's no other uh, really consumer perception takeaway than one cleans better than the other. Uh, test prove claims, where you, uh, if you're going to have a test prove claim, whether you say uh, studies show or test prove that your product uh, relieves headaches better or pain, pain better, uh, doesn't matter. If you're uh, saying uh, that you're showing something like uh, a car being faster than another car or something cleaning better and, and making the claim, that uh, a, a product works better than a competitive product on a direct comparative claim. And it, and it indicates that there must be a test to prove that. Otherwise, how could you show that, that, uh, that claim? Then there, there, it's a test proof claim, whether you say test proof or not. Uh, it, and if you don't have a test and you're making that claim, then you're automatically falsely advertising because consumers believe there's a test. And when you have a test or claim you have a test that your product is better than another product or better than all the other products out there, uh, and you don't have a test, then that's automatically false advertising. And that's the easiest case there is. Um, so it's, it's good to have those tests, the, the uh, scientific substantiation test. Uh, and oftentimes that, uh, scientific substantiation is done through an industry standard testing. Um, and it's usually industry standard comes about because one or two leaders in the industry have come up with a test to demonstrate why their products perform better than other products. And oftentimes it might be an ASTM standard that was put together by uh, a number of entities or competitors in that industry. And so that's often uh, thought of as the best test for substantiating claims that are typically made in particular product category. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to use the industry standard test. Sometimes you could come up with a better test than what the industry standard purports to be. And when you, when you have that test, you really have to show that in a particular circumstance and given the particular claim that's made, that the test that you're providing is a better test than the industry standard test. The NAD looks at that uh, often when they're looking at, uh, at what's the test that's gonna prove this claim. And sometimes there's not an industry standard test and you have to develop your own testing. And it's very important in those situations to have an expert in the, in the category or in the area. It's very important to have a protocol that's based on scientific principles. It's very important to use uh, uh, testing uh, uh, pieces, uh, testing uh, apparatus that is uh, typical for making those types of tests, whether it's determining lumens in a flashlight or the suction power of a vacuum. Uh, and it's also important to make sure that the testing equipment that is used is calibrated and that the calibration is certified. So there's a lot of, as, as you might imagine, there are a lot of pitfalls and the competitor attacking your scientific substantiation if you don't follow scientific procedures and use all the right equipment to do that. Uh, but obviously, if you have that substantiation ahead of time, before you make that claim, then uh, you're in the best case, best position. If somebody brings an emergency litigation against you for a, uh, a claim that you make and you have that substantiation, that scientific substantiation, already in the bag, ready to say, I've got substantiation for that claim. I think this uh, you should withdraw that motion for a temporary uh, restraining order. Here's my, here's my evidence of that. And you're not gonna be able to prove otherwise. Uh, that's a very powerful way to, in advance, block somebody who's coming after you, a competitor who's trying to get, get market share. Uh, the second category or bucket is uh, consumer perception. Uh, and there are many experts uh, in consumer perception. There is a standard type of survey evidence that's, that's used as part of the complex litigation guide that federal court judges rely on. 
And, uh, and it's important when you have implied claims or a net impression defense. You know, my ad, if you look at the entire ad, is delivering a certain message to consumers. And that net impression of the ad makes certain claims. And when somebody wants to bring a false advertising claim, they have to first determine what the net impression is of the ad. And then they have to determine if the net impression is X, then is X false? Is that message to consumers, is that false or true? If they determine the message is false, then they have to show why it's false. And sometimes when you're, you're the one bringing the action, you can say, well, I think the net impression is X and I think it's false in these circumstances. And then you can demonstrate through a consumer perception, perception study or surveys as they're uh, uh, called frequently, uh, that he, here's what consumers perceive from this. Um, and they understand what the message is and they're not deceived by it. And when you have that kind of uh, evidence, uh, then it's very important uh, in the defense of the claim. There of course will be an expert on the other side who, who may be challenging the manner in which the survey was done, or the study was done and, and what was left out and why the questions were bad or leading and all of those things. Uh, but it's good to have that substantiation ahead of time. Now, the reality is that most companies won't do or spend the money on a consumer perception study because they haven't determined whether the advertisement, say it's a, uh, a 30 second commercial, and they haven't determined whether that's gonna really work and sell products. So they don't wanna spend the amount of money that is necessary um, to determine what the, what the takeaway is. And if it's a closed case and you say, well, I could see it being looked at or some consumers taking it in a particular way. Uh, uh, surveys, typically, if you can show that 20% of consumers have a certain impression and that impression is false, that's enough to, uh, to, to prove false advertising. Um, on the other hand, uh, you might want to, and we have many, there are many uh, consumer expert uh, consumer perception experts out there. And uh, as, as outside counsel, we, we have uh, relationships with a lot of them, as do uh, a lot of you and, and plenty of in-house counsel. And with those relationships, when you might want to show that ad to an expert, and they may be able to tell you what they think, uh, or what they expect a consumer survey to, to indicate to consumers Obviously, you can't rely on that. They won't give a, an expert opinion that that's what the result's going to be. They'll have to do a survey to determine that. But it, it helps give guidance uh, to the company, to you, to, in advising the company on, hey, this is a problem. We really ought to look at this. We probably should do a survey if you really want to go forward with these claims. Uh, on the other hand, they can say, well, I think, you know, I don't think the consumers are going to perceive this as, as gift delivering a message that uh, might deceive or lead them astray. Um, and so you might want to take the risk on going without doing a study in advance. But it's good to have uh, an expert on uh, consumer perception standing by in case a study has to be done. So with that um, uh, substantiation, again, if you can get it in advance, is the best thing you can have. So we're going to talk a little bit about puffery. Um, this is actually one of my favorite subjects in advertising and because it's so useful. It's useful for potential prevention of advertising claims. It's useful for defense if you do it properly. And it's actually a pretty useful marketing strategy, um, as we'll give an example of, because it helps uh, your product or your brand stick in the mind of consumers. So what is puffery? Puffery statements in advertising that do not convey, convey facts or measurable claims, but just mere opinion. It helps you gain attention for your brand. It's often humorous or outrageous or just something crazy that's really going to stick with the consumer after they finish watching your ad or uh, viewing your commercial or whatever it may be. And it always says something positive about your product or service without making any sort of the claims that Roger was just talking about that would require substantiation. 
Um, and as I said, it's a defense. You know, it's not actionable in a false advertising lawsuit if you can properly show that a consumer wouldn't take any sort of measurable claim or message from it. And it doesn't require any substantiation, which would avoid a lot of the expense that Roger was talking about, about figuring out whether or not you need to test or actually doing testing or actually you know, getting an expert to evaluate the consumer perception. Um, it's just a really good way to make your ad, make your brand memorable without taking as much risk as making concrete express or implied claims. So here are just some quick definitions you know, across the circuits on puffery, uh, marketing that is not deceptive for no one would rely on the exaggerated claim, a general claim of superiority over comparable products that's so vague it can be understood as nothing more than a mere expression of opinion, uh, exaggerated advertising, blustering and boasting upon which no reasonable per buyer would rely, marketing claims that no ordinary consumers would take seriously. So we're gonna give you a little quick example of that um, just so you can see the kind of thing that we're talking about. And this is from an actual case um, in the Northern District of Illinois that went a few years ago. Um, but this was the claim, this was the advertisement at issue. Wanna know why I didn't last five hours? I just proved the theory of relativity. I mastered origami while beating the record for hacky sack. Found Bigfoot. I swam the English Channel. And then I swam back. And then I took the dogs for a walk. How do I do all this? Five hour energy. Hours of energy now with no crash later. Underlay! So that's a humorous advertisement, and uh, most people, I think, would probably view that advertisement and not believe that you're going to track down Bigfoot or win a hacky sack competition just because you took five-hour energy. But there was one plaintiff in the Northern District of Illinois in 2016 who decided that five-hour energy was not being honest with them and that five-hour energy deliberately wanted him to think that if he used their product, he would be able to do some of these outrageous things. And of course, the court said, you know, no way, nobody's going to believe, no reasonable person is going to believe that you can disprove the theory of relativity or master origami or beat the record for hacky sack just because you drank a five hour energy. It was obviously meant to be a joke, obviously, obviously meant to be funny, very effective in making the product stick in a person's head, but not making any actual claims that needed substantiation. And therefore, that case was dismissed because they found it to be puffery. And of course, that's another uh, situation where you uh, you, you, you might uh, have to think about, well, uh, how is it that uh, somebody thinks this is actual uh, advertising, but it might be one of those situations where do you really need to do a consumer perception study uh, to, to demonstrate to the court that there's no reasonable takeaway here uh, that the one person thought there was. All right, so the cease and desist letter, I mentioned it before. Uh, you want to level the playing field when, they're, when, when it comes to a cease and desist letter. And we're doing this, we're talking about this from the standpoint that you or the company you work for might receive a, a cease and desist letter. And as in-house counsel or outside counsel, how do you, how do you help the, the client respond to that? Well, uh, oftentimes it's from the outside counsel of a, uh, of a competitor or the in-house counsel, and they're, they're laying out the, uh, the false advertising. They think that your latest commercial or a commercial that's been running for a while has, has presented. And so what you, what you really need to do in those situations is to, uh, is to look at the competitor's advertising. If they're a competitor of yours, uh, they're complaining about your advertising, likely they're advertising a similar or the same type of product and they're going to have the same issues that you're having and uh, what you can claim, what substantiation you have to have, uh, what the consumer takeaway is. And, and I would say almost every time uh, there's what would be considered, uh, in quotations, a, uh, a, cla a counterclaim, right? And so when you respond to a, uh, a cease and desist order, uh, you're, you're really doing a couple of things. One, you're starting with, hey, I've looked at, uh, I got your letter of you know, January 15th, and uh, it made me look at your advertising, and here's what I found. 
you're making false claims about X, Y, and Z. And you start with that and you lay out very in very much detail why those claims are false and why they, uh, they need to cease those claims. They may have asked you for, for your substantiation for making the claims that they claim uh, are false uh, that, that your company purportedly made. And so you would probably want to ask them for their substantiation, right? Because they, maybe they have it, maybe they don't. And, and if, if it's a brand new commercial you've put out, maybe you do have some issues with that commercial. Maybe it's a commercial that's been running for a while. Well, doing a, a, a quote unquote counterclaim back puts that issue, what they have to look at and, and what they have to respond to. It also means that you have the opportunity to say to them, look, uh, this commercial has been running for a while, but we think our claims are fully substantiated and uh, we have uh, the ability to prove that in court. Uh, we're in the process of changing out our advertising for this quarter. And it gives you an opportunity. And what does this really mean when you talk about cease and desist letters between companies? What is really, really critical as an in-house counsel um, is to have a relationship with your counterpart at the competitor or competitors that your company uh, really works with. And what's critical about that is it often opens a channel or has a, a channel that remains open um, uh, as the companies move forward and compete with each other that the, the CEOs of those two companies may not be able to talk to each other because they hate each other or they're mad at each other or whatever it might be. And what typically happens in these cease and desist letter back and forth it's, a, it's another way for companies to say, hey, I think you're deceiving consumers. I think that uh, you're trying to get an advantage, trying to get market share unfairly, and that I'm looking, I'm watching, and I see that you're, you're misleading consumers and you need to stop that. And when you write back, you're saying the same thing to them. It allows both parties to kind of resolve a dispute by either changing their advertising, modifying their advertising, stopping their advertising without going to court, without having to, um, to spend money on litigation. And as you develop relationships with your counterparts at your competitors, what you find is that these cease and desist letters change. Um, so a cease and desist letter to deal with one particular issue that you think is deceptive might be just bringing it to their attention saying, I'm watching, you need to stop that. You know, you can't do that. And they might stop, they might ignore it. They usually will write back if they can find something wrong with yours. Other times an ad may have come out and it's so outrageous and, and attacking your company and your company's products that you're ready to bring a temporary restraining order so, or preliminary injunction, some type of emergency litigation to stop that ad from being seen by consumers. And the tone of your letter changes. And so you, you might be writing a letter saying, hey, I saw the ad you just came out with. I see you just started running it. This is attacking our, you're trash canning our, our, our product. You're saying it contains ingredients it doesn't contain. You're scaring consumers away from our product. They're afraid to use it. It might be a food item or something like that. And you might send a cease and desist letter saying, I really need you to get back to me by the end of the day. Otherwise, we'll have to take action because this is so much harming us in an irreparable way that we have to stop it. And through that channel, <laughs> your counterpart is going to take it to the CEO and say, hey, this is a problem. We need to look at this. Do we need to take this down? Are we ready for emergency injunctive relief? Can we defend this? And where are you going to be on that side? But the cease and desist letters, they go between at least the industry leaders in many industries or product categories. They utilize that ability to have that channel open. They can get things resolved uh, in a way that uh, results in the least damage to both parties, right? Nobody wants to go defend a TRO and, and they might lose and then they've got to recall the product. You know, there are ways to, to work these things out. And uh, sometimes it's, it's just a, uh, a fact of being able to, to you know, if it's not the TRO level of cease and desist, it might be, hey, look, we're changing our, 
uh, we're changing advertising anyway. We've got uh, 10 more uh, commercials that are going to be running in the next 10 days. After that, we're going to stop, right? And that that may be enough to say, all right, we're, we're done with that issue. Uh, otherwise, it may be that you have to go and uh, and end up fighting it uh, in court in, on an emergency basis. So you've done everything you can, you substantiated, you puffed, but you still get that scary civil investigative demand or civil subpoena from the FTC or from an attorney general. And what do you do? What steps do you take? Uh, the beginning of such an investigation is very, very important. It's really important to get off on the right foot. First thing you gotta do, you gotta preserve your documents. The last thing you want is to find yourself months, months, and months later trying to do a document production just to find out that all those documents that you may have needed to show the FTC or the Attorney General that you weren't doing what they thought you were doing were deleted through your normal document retention policy. So identify the staff that are relevant to whatever the FTC or Attorney General may be accusing you of, talk to them, interview them, retain counsel to do research on sort of what the claims may be, also what settlements that the regulators have recently uh, done. Just try to assess the outside risk. How big a deal is this going to be? Are you looking at potentially enjoining the activity? Are you looking at huge monetary penalties? It's important to know from the beginning, you know, how much this could potentially affect your company and what sort of tactics you need to take considering the business risk of such an investigation. And then once you kind of have that information in hand, once you've done some of those interviews, once you kind of understand the scope of the issue a little bit in-house, that's when your counsel can reach out to the regulator and begin to try to probe them for the purpose and scope of the investigation. So this is when you sort of really get into the meat of the investigation. You want your counsel to do interviews with relevant employees and identify all the relevant sources of information. You know, the more you understand and the faster you understand it, the more equipped you're going to be to go and have a real discussion about hopefully narrowing it. You know, the FTC and Attorney General, they're going to ask for the moon. They're going to want all your documents. They're going to speak to all your employees. They're going to put all the claims that could possibly relate to the marketing activity out at issue into this civil investigative demand or civil subpoena. But oftentimes, once you understand the scope and once you understand the documents and you, once you understand what's really at issue, you can go back to them and say, hey, look, this is what you're concerned about. You don't really need all of this information because this information isn't really relevant to what you're concerned about. What are you really worried about? If you're really worried about this, these are the five people you need to talk to. These are five sources of documents we really have. Anything else we're gonna produce will be irrelevant. And that's the kind of discussion that you wanna have. And then you can consider some other tactics. If you really feel like for some reason the civil investigative demand is overreaching, you can't negotiate with the FTC or the Attorney General, you may want to think about filing a motion to quash or, protective or for a protective order. But remember that's always a risk because if for some reason it's a sensitive issue that you're trying to keep, you know, confidential, then you might not want to turn it into a potentially public fight trying to get rid of the subpoena in that way. So as I sort of alluded to, you wanna to start to think about narrowing the demand. You can do that in several different ways. You can talk to the staff about, you know, the particular relevance of, you know, certain things they're asking for. Is it really relevant to the market activity you're concerned about? You can negotiate search terms where instead of just giving them all the emails from a particular custodian who's relevant, really narrowing it down to important terms that are going to bring in the information that they actually need. You can figure out what sort of information you actually need to search. Do you need to actually search people's personal phones? Do you need to pull Slack data and messaging apps? Do we need to go through hard copy emails, the hard copy uh, documents in the basement, or do we just need to pull our emails? You know, how many custodians do you really need? If there are redundancies in people sending emails to each other, do we really need to pull all the emails of this person? If this person is that person's boss, and they will be on every important email. Do we really need to pull both of these? There are ways for you to really limit, you know, how much you need to pull and how many documents your counsel is ultimately going to have to review to turn over to the FTC or to Attorney General. And also the timing. Uh, they're going to want them in some sort of ridiculous amount of time that is probably unreasonable. 
And so you want to talk to them about, okay, can we get an extension? Um, all right, what if we just roll documents to you as we find them? Will that keep you satisfied as long as you see we're progressing? Um, and the importance of narrowing the investigation is really to avoid phishing. The last thing you want is for an investigation to start in one place and end up in a completely different place because while they're going through your documents, they're finding new issues to investigate. So you want to collect the information and really gain an internal understanding of the issues before you start just turning over substantive information to the regulator. Okay, so uh, another thing that's very important in regula regulator or regulatory investigations is what's your response going to be? And one easy way to think about that is what's your narrative, right? What's the company's story? Where did it come from? Why you're in the business that you're in? What are your justifications for the actions that you've taken? Uh, why is the regulator misunderstanding what those actions are? How can you explain it best? And when you think about that, you know, the most critical thing that there is uh, are white papers. Uh, and your responses to interrogatories. So interrogatories are a way, interrogatory responses are the way to lay out your defenses, explain the conduct, I, uh, identify and produce documents that support that narrative, indicate why the uh, regulator is wrong or doesn't understand a way of, the way a particular business works, why the, the, uh, the violation or assumed violation they're pursuing isn't a violation at all and how it complies with the law. And that's important that you do it in the white paper as well as in your responses, uh, because it will lay out the facts that you've been providing to the regulator and the law that everybody should know when they're dealing with a regulator that would support a summary judgment. You're basically telling that regulator, uh, if we go to trial, Here's how we're going to win and you're going to lose. And all of that is in preparation of how you're going to resolve this. Again, if you go back to the beginning, you know, what's the goal? How are we going to get there? What's our strategy to get there? This is one example as it relates to regulatory investigations. And the most critical part of the white papers is to get it to the regulatory body. And so as an example, the FTC, before the FTC staff makes any recommendations up the chain of command, up to the supervisors, up to the bureau, up to the commissioners, right? Once a position is taken by regulators or the staff, uh, whether it's a uh, attorney general or the FTC or some other regulator, the FDA, whatever it might be, the most important thing is to make sure that that, that staff level uh, group or person understands that this is why they're wrong. You've laid out what's wrong with their case and how it will be, in, 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 in essence, a disaster if they go forward. Once they make the recommendation, it's really, really hard for them to change that recommendation. Everybody's going to question, well, last week you were saying we should file a complaint. Now you're saying maybe we shouldn't, right? It, it looks bad for them. It's very difficult for them to change. So make sure, if at all possible, you understand and communicate with the regulator and staff uh, as to what the timing is and that you want to provide a white paper before they make a recommendation because you're going to explain to them why it could be wrong. All right, competitor lawsuits and counterclaims. You know, one of the things, I don't think I've ever defended a litigation where I didn't bring counterclaims. And there's always a counterclaim out there, particularly in advertising law. Uh, you know, if you, if you were 100% compliant and made sure that all the T's were crossed and I's dotted, you probably wouldn't sell any product because there's always some level of risk and in, in how an advertisement goes. You can't be 100% sure that it's completely perfect and, and it will, and it will uh, bring in revenue and sell product. Uh, and so it's often just an analysis of risk. And because of that, uh, there's almost always a counterclaim in, some, in a competitor's advertisement. And one of the reasons that a counterclaim is effective, right? Whether it's a uh, um, you know, competitor lawsuit under 43A or a competitor, competitor lawsuit under the Unfair and Deceptive Trade Practices Act, one of the things that, that you, you wanna be able to do is to put some skin in the game uh, by the competitor uh, that, that forces them to focus on their defenses and they have to focus on the claims they're bringing against you 
And it ultimately gives you the opportunity to resolve uh, the matter short of, uh, uh, of going through the litigation. Last case we had that uh, we were going to trial with on uh, in the early part of the year, we had counterclaims. Turns out we won summary judgment uh, against the plaintiff on their claims against our client. And so we were uh, on, the, on the courthouse steps the night before um, the trial, and it was a, a, a free shot by our client. And in our view, the only question was how much money are they going to pay? It turns out they paid a lot of money because here, can you imagine trying to explain to your client, hey, we brought these claims and now you're, you're going to end up spending millions of dollars to not have to go to trial or you might lose even more. And the, the, that's why you always bring counterclaims, if at all possible. And if you look at the Unfair and Deceptive Trade Practices Act, uh, in cases like that, one thing that you, in addition to um, uh, defending uh, a claim, whether it's a uh, plaintiff's class action or a competitor who's using that statute, right, is to look at uh, statutes. You look at, uh, for example, there's preemption and preclusion, uh, and I'm gonna let you take a look at this slide later if you want, but there are uh, preemption and preclusion issues in any, in any lawsuit. So for example, uh, oftentimes an FDA claim uh, could be precluded uh, in a, because of a particular type of claim. Likewise, a claim might be preempted, for example, in a, uh, the Poultry Products Inspection Act. USDA has uh, exclusive jurisdiction over advertising label claims under that act, and uh, it, it you know, might not apply to internet claims, but it applies to label claims. And that could eliminate that complaint uh, in, in court, in federal or state court. Uh, same with uh, FDA claims, same with when you're defending class actions for those types of claims. We're going a little quicker now because we're running we're out of time. We're running out of time, but uh, one other nuance of potential UDAP lawsuits by competitors is that many uh, UDAP uh, provisions don't actually provide a private right of action for competitors, only for the attorney general or a customer we gave some examples here, which we can provide, but it's always good to look and research that because it's a good way to potentially get state claims knocked out on a motion to dismiss. Well, last thing we really want to talk about is, um, is, is settlement or resolution. And it's most important to talk about creative solutions, not just dollars and cents. And so many, many, many uh, litigations and false advertising have been resolved through business solutions. Remember, we talked about that at the beginning. There can be a business solution to a business problem. Sometimes I've had, I've had clients buy companies where the company has sued and they end up selling their company to my client. Uh, they might go into a, a product together. They might agree that, hey, I'll, I'm gonna sell through my product and I won't sell it anymore. Might be some kind of an IP claim, right? Uh, but, and sometimes they might uh, just join forces on particular products and say, you know, uh, it's the enemies become uh, business partners. And then also well, pays to be creative when you talk about uh, selling, selling with regulators. And, and the, oftentimes the uh, easiest uh, uh, settlement or resolution is providing a simple solution. In the very first Rosca case that uh, the FTC brought an action in, we resolved that case by providing a solution uh, a very simple solution that the FTC agreed with, and it turned out to be a teaching tool for the FTC as to what you need to do in order to comply with ROSCA, the federal uh, auto renewal statute, if you will. And, and coming up with a very simple solution uh, that the, the other side, in this case, it was the FTC, would agree to, and also uh, sets forth a path for anyone who wants to uh, be in the auto renewal business to comply with is an easy way to do it. And that from back in, I think it was about 10 years ago, um, that's still as, as held today in that, in that solution. So with that, uh, I think we're out of time and- uh, Thank you, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, sorry if we didn't get to any of your questions. The code once again is FALSE2022. Um, but if you have any questions for us, uh, we're here, please feel free to reach out and hopefully we'll see you again at one of these things. All right, have a good one.